in this second lecture, we give a closer look at software practices. We use extreme programming as a navigator to discuss the practices of pair programming, test-driven development, or shared code base. As highlighted in our discussion with Cars, your ability to engage in these practices empowers you to take an active role in the development process, ensuring your design is what gets implemented. We can put extreme programming next to Scrum and Kanban in the approaches to agile development. However, can Beck developed it from the software engineering perspective rather than the development process perspective. It relies on four pillars that are compatible with all the agile methodology. First, simplicity, actively looking for the simplest thing that could possibly work. We already recognize here the focus on minimizing complexity. Then comes communication with continuous knowledge transfer among team members through face-to-face -face interaction and appropriate drawing tools. It connects to module five of software design. The third pillar focuses on feedback with a constant look for improvement and adjustment. And finally, it calls for courage by putting ego aside, raising issues, embracing reviews, and acting on feedback. Sharing code ownership. Project's failure is everyone's responsibility here. As the name of the approach suggests, extreme programming takes good practices from software engineering and pushes them to the extreme. However, these practices are still very much valid out of the approach. So let's look at a few of them. Let's start with testing, an essential step in the development process to ensure that the code does what it should. There's a whole range of software tests. In the Python programming assignments, we've used unit tests to check that each code's function behaves the way it should. It is the smallest unit of code you can test. Then integration, functional, end-to-end -end tests validate that pieces of code work together. Even systems work together. Finally, on a meta level, come performance tests that evaluate the software based on defined metrics. Test first or test driven programming is an interesting idea to bring testing before the code implementation. At first, all tests fail, and as the code gets implemented, they gradually turn green. With this approach, tests become a specification. If all tests pass, the software complies with the specification and can be automatically released. As a designer, within this approach, you might want to keep a close eye to those tests as they shape actually the final design. Code review is another important elements of software quality. Connecting to our discussion with Cars again, he walked us through such a process, taking on a task from the Kanban board. He edited a copy of the code on his machine to complete the job and pushed the code on the server. Then he opened up a pull request. That is the terms to tell the rest of the team I completed the task. I would like to make a new feature available to our users. What do you think? Then someone else in the team, likely several person actually, pick up the request and review the code. They test the code on their development environment and start the conversation. Is the code up to the standards set by the team? Does the functionality behave the way everyone expects? The conversation remains open until the necessary discussion and changes take place. When the team agrees, the pull request is accepted and the code gets merged with the shared code base. It is ready to be released to the users. 
observes your role as a designer again here. By taking part of the review process, you stay on top of your design requirement up to the product release. With extreme programming, peer review is pushed to the extreme. It takes place through peer programming. In this situation, the code review is actually continuous. Two persons work together on the same task, ideally on the same computer. The driver is the one writing the codes, thinking aloud and explaining what he or she is doing. Writing the code, the focus is on the detail. The navigator is the one reviewing the codes and thinking ahead. He or she also answers the driver's questions and suggests what to do next. Communication is key in this approach and both driver and navigator should continuously talk about the task at hand. It is important to switch roles regularly while sticking rigorously to the roles for the given period. For instance, the navigator should not touch the keyboard. But is it indeed a waste of resources? Indeed, there is no sign of getting tasks done faster with peer review in the statistics. However, the code quality, the shared knowledge and the social environment is greatly improved. It is indeed an excellent exercise for sharing knowledge and learning how to teach. By the way, teaching is the best way to check if you understand something yourself. Pair programming takes a great deal of patience, but also confidence to speak up. You need to own what you know and be willing to admit when you do not know something. Basically, you learn how to give and take. We talked about collaboration, copying codes, pulling and pushing codes to and from a server. Here are some other needs. The team members work in parallel on multiple aspects of the product, from the user interaction to the network, data, hardware. The code runs on various devices if only on the computers of the team members. It often also involves servers and prototyping devices such as Raspberry Pi. We want to experiment without the fear of losing what we have achieved so far. We want to keep track of which code we run for which version of our prototype and collected data. The backbone that supports all these needs is a version control system such as Git. Let's pause for a disclaimer here. Some scientists prove that the momentum model of Git reflects the system perspective rather than the user perspective. A bad thing to do, isn't it? Our explanation of Git has been inspired for several years now by Alice Barlett's talk, Git for Humans, which I definitely encourage you to watch if you cannot make sense of the Git's terminology. With Git, you have a repository, the directory that contains all the files of your project. A full copy lies on every team member's computer. A commit is a snapshot of that repository at a given time. When you commit, you attach to the snapshot a message that describes what changed and why compared to the previous version. It is attached to your name and the current time. Each commit is unique and identified by a hash, a unique reference to that specific snapshot of the repository. Here, we represent each commit as a circle on this timeline, which goes from left to right. Checkout is the time machine. At any time, it enables you to bring back to life a specific version of your code. You select the commit you want to go back to and checkout will bring in your repository all the files as they were at that specific moment in time. It does not mean that you lose what you have done afterwards. Using the same process, you can travel 
to the latest commit as well. As we mentioned earlier, we want the confidence that we can experiment without fear. This is where branches come into play. A branch is a label that we attach to a commit that snapshot in time. The default branch is master here in black. Let's imagine a chart needs to be improved on cars building rhythm project. We create a branch to work on these changes here in blue. What we did, we labeled the commit with the name change time COVID chart. This way, we keep track of the changes, but we know still exactly where the original, the master code is. And this works for as many branches as we want. I might have the code from cars on my machine so that I can test it as part of my code review, for example. I might also have some experiments on the side which I can only dedicate a couple of hours a week. Now, if I am done with my task, I want to merge it with the master branch, bringing it all together. And I might do another merge when I am happy with the experiment I had on the side. So when we merge, we combine two versions of the code. It creates a new commit, a snapshot that includes the changes of both branches. Note that some changes might be conflicting. For example, the same line of code might be edited in both versions. Thus, you get to decide what to keep and what to discard. We work in a team with the need to both share the code among team members, but also backing up our work. This is where GitHub or GitLab come into play. In Git, we call them the remotes, but they are not more than a computer with Git and a copy of the repository. To get started with a project whose code lies on a remote, you clone this repository. You literally make a copy of it on your own computer, including all versions since the project started. When Cars is done with a task, he pushes his commits on the remote, in that case, GitLab. On top of Git, GitLab provides many social and project management features, as we saw with the Kanban board, the pull request, with the ability to discuss the code. Responding to his call for code review, I want to test his code on my computer. Thus, I pull the latest repositories version from GitLab, which includes Cars branch that is waiting for review. That's it for this brief introduction to development methods. We highlighted the activities and processes of software development, and we've looked at a concrete example of iterative prototyping. In the second lecture, we've looked closer to the software development practices, such as testing, reviewing, and pair programming. Finally, we introduced Git, a version control system working together with a service such as GitHub or GitLab as the backbone of the development process. I invite you to explore further for the book chapter for this week. The knowledge exercise for this week focuses on testing prototypes. In the programming assignment, we will guide you through the steps of Git as well as pair programming. Looking forward to your thoughts and reaction on this course. We'll discuss them there and we will see you on Thursday to highlight some themes.